Are we good? Okay, now we're on, yeah. I just wanted to say welcome. And for those of you who are here this week that weren't here last week, uh, we're so glad to have you. This is Pat Hannah right here. She's our Women's Bible Study Coordinator, if you've not met Hannah. And I hope that y'all are all uh, introducing yourselves to each other and getting to know one another because we're gonna spend a long time together in eternity, right? So it'd be good for us to go ahead and get started. Thank you for sitting up here on the front row. All these ladies received a $100 bill. And so you might, <coughs> you might want to consider next week moving closer to the front. It goes from 100 to a 50 to a 20. So those of you on the back row who didn't get anything, that's why y'all are on the but no, I'm kidding we're just glad that you're here and um, I hope you had a good time with your study this past week did you good all right now I have been told that I need to slow down is that right okay I will slow down if y'all will listen faster is it a deal <laughs> Oh, Heavenly Father, we come to you with joy. We come to you with anticipation. Lord, I love these ladies, and some of them I've just met. So I can't imagine how much you must just want to gush over them, how much you want to just pour your love and joy and peace into them. Oh, Lord, thank you for inviting us to come to your sanctuary. Thank you for inviting us and giving us the opportunity to study your word. We love you, we praise you, and Lord, we are hungry to hear, to read, to study, to stand, and to speak for you. And all the people said, amen, amen. All right, as you know, open your Bibles. We're looking at Acts, and we're continuing where we left off last week with Acts chapter 2. If you missed the video or if you missed being here last Wednesday, the church is videotaping these, and so you'll be able to go on the Trinity Baptist Church uh, Women's Bible Study website and watch it. And if you think I talk too fast, you can adjust the speed on YouTube, and you can slow me down. So it is your responsibility for a uh, list listening at your own speed. How does that sound? We're looking at Acts of the Holy Spirit, and today we're looking at two main divisions. The first one is Acts 2, 1 through 13, that Pentecost marks the birth of the church with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And our second division that we'll be looking at is Acts 2, 14 through 21, the beginning of Peter's sermon. Peter takes a stand, and he stands on the Word. He stands on the fulfillment of Scripture prophecy, and I just love that part. God sends the promised Holy Spirit at Pentecost, baptizing and filling the apostles. I get so excited. I can't help it when I read the Word, and I place myself there, and I think what it must have been like. Jesus had been with these disciples and with these apostles, and if you would take the time sometime, go through and just research every time it says, and Jesus spoke to them about the kingdom of God. And Jesus spoke to them about the kingdom of God. Jesus wasn't here to fix earth, right? Jesus wasn't here to fix this current culture. Jesus was here to tell people about his kingdom, and to invite people to his kingdom. And ladies, that is what we must be about. You know, when September rolls around every year, what do we think about? 9-11, correct? And Todd Beamer is known for being one of the people who on an airplane that was headed to the United States Capitol, they realized that the plane was being hijacked. And instead of just being a passenger and going along with a hijacker with the enemy's plans, Todd Beamer and a few other men, they decided to do something. Do you remember his cry that had those men with him charge forward and take down the hijackers? Do you remember his cry? Let's roll. Say it with me. Let's roll. And I believe today that what the Lord is saying to the church and what he ushered in at Pentecost was let's roll. Let's rise. There is an enemy on this earth, and it is his dominion. The earth is. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit didn't sit back, though, and watch the demise of all of us instead, they sent Jesus to earth to die for our sins. And 
be resurrected and ascend to the Father. And we are looking at Pentecost. I cannot imagine the excitement and the joy in our Lord Jesus Christ, who Revelation 114 describes, who has eyes like a flame, a fire. You know that? Revelation 1.14, when John is describing Jesus, he said, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. Jesus, full of the fire, the passion, the glory of the Holy Spirit in his body, in his essence, looked at the Father and the Holy Spirit and said, it is the time, it is the epic, it is this period in all eternity. Let's roll, let's rise, go, go. And the Holy Spirit, boom, boom. And forever now, forever now, you and I have the opportunity to be a part of that team, my clock is asking me if I fell. <laughs> my half off because I'm doing this. No, I did not fall. I'm going up, not down. <laughs> Pentecost, Pentecost. Shavuot, Exodus 34, 22 was established 50 days after Passover. Who were the people who were there? They were all the males, all the Jewish males from all over the world. The population in Jerusalem would rise from 150,000 to a million at least. And the promise that the disciples were hoping for, the apostles were seeking and praying about, was perhaps would this be the time that Jesus, the Lord, would send the promised Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit presented in tongues of fire. Let's read Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly... There came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak. Speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Oh, this is just so exciting. There is so much in this one verse. We could camp out here all day. I know you have wondered, did Pentecost occur in the upper room? Because it says the house where they were all gathered. But we, Scripture, interpret Scripture. So when you have a question about Scripture, look at how that word, that verse, uh, that message is in other places. If you read in Acts 5.12, it tells us where they were accustomed to gathering. It says, at the hands, many of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's portico. This seemed to be a gathering place for them. As you recall, they, they of course, would go, be in the upper room. They would pray. They would the fellowship, they would share meals, but then they would go to the temple courts. Acts 7, 47, for those of you who are saying, but it says house, not temple. I understand, I get you. But in Acts 7, 47, David, it is told, found favor in God's sight so that he could, he, David wanted to build a house, a temple for the Lord. But verse 47 says, but it was Solomon who built a house. For the Lord. So when we look at this, we know that where Pentecost likely, and this isn't a, a deal breaker, is it? But it's just interesting. It likely took place on Solomon's portico due to the amount of over 3,000 people responding that could have had that many people rather than just the upper room. Commentators think most likely this is also true because Solomon's portico is located along the eastern wall opposite the Mount of Olives where Zechariah 14.4 says Jesus will return. And Ezekiel 43.1-4 through 4 describes uh, the Lord God returning to his house uh, as a vision of of the divine appearance. And for some reason, my Bible is losing Ezekiel. I promise I can find, I think I'm the only person that doesn't have tabs on her Bible, right? I want to share with you 
because we need to catch this. It's so important for us to understand because he's coming again. He's coming again. The divine presence of God is coming again. Can I just get a hallelujah? hallelujah. I mean, seriously, gals, we can, we can shout in church. It's just perfectly okay. 43, then he led me to the gate, Ezekiel. 43, verse 1, then he led me to the gate, the gate facing toward the east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the way of the east, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. Have you heard that? Revelation 1. And the earth shone with his glory, it was like the appearance of the vision I saw when he came to destroy the city. Verse 4, And the glory of the Lord came into the house, the temple, by way of the gate facing toward the east. And the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court. And behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. This earth is going to be recreated. This heaven and earth are being destroyed. Read Revelation. Go and get my free end times videos that will explain to you how the glory of the Lord is returning. We read in Acts 2, 2 through 3, 8 that suddenly... There came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole place where they were sitting. And there appeared those tongues of fire. Now, ladies, this is so important that we catch this next point. It is amazing, and it is for the student who is hungry, the person who is really wanting more than Sunday school answers, and for you to be content with what you learned in elementary school as a child in Sunday school classes. God has layers of of understanding and wisdom for us to glean. And because you are here, you will glean that. This word, where it says they distributed themselves, don't let this pass you by. The Holy Spirit is not an it that God sent. Here's a here's Holy Spirit, here's a Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the person, the equal Godhead, and the Holy Spirit chose and distributed himself with these tongues of fire, that appeared as tongues of fire, on whom they went. I'll take Peter, you take him. Okay, I'll take Thomas. Willful distribution. Pay attention. It says they rested on each one. In the Greek, this word rested means to confer a kingdom upon. To confer a kingdom upon. The disciples had asked in Acts 1, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? And he said, it's not for you to know the times and the epics. The Father has fixed, but you will receive power. You, in other words, will receive the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is going to come upon you literally. God put, he conferred the, his kingdom in you and me. God put his reign, he put his power in us. The kingdom of God is now in us. In Luke 17, 21, Jesus said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. We're not fixing the roads. We're not building earthly buildings. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in you. Oh, ladies, this is God's call. Let's roll. This is God's call. Wake up. This is God's call saying, you don't have to be a weak woman. You don't have to be in self-pity. You don't have to be anxious about what's going on in D.C. Yes, pay attention. Yes, vote wisely. Yes, do your part as a responsible citizen of this earth. But don't forget, you're a citizen of heaven and the kingdom of God is in you and you are being on your way to the kingdom in heaven. Now at Mount Sinai, 
God gave the Jews the law, and they became a kingdom of priests. In 2 Chronicles 7, 21, the presence of God descended on Solomon's temple that he had built for the Lord, and it was filled with the Lord's glory. The priests could not even enter because it was so full of the Lord's glory. And here, the Spirit, the glory of God, descended on the disciples, on the apostles, who 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, whom you have from God? You have been bought with a price. You are not your own. And so here I'm looking as just as in Acts 2 describes the Spirit distributing himself like tongues of fire on the apostles. I'm sitting here, and they were the temples. They were the fleshly temples instead of rock temples. I'm looking today at you at a temple of the Holy Spirit with the fire of the Lord in you. I'm looking at a temple of the Holy Spirit. This sanctuary is full of temples of the Holy Spirit. Have you, have you understood that? Have you thanked him? Have you grasped that you have the glory of God in you? Father, we just want to stop right now and say, Lord, this is beyond our, our comprehension except you've written it for us. And you've had your faithful ones explain it in different books of the Bible. Oh, God. Help us reverence you. Help our temples be cleaned of defilement. Help our temples not present to family members and others as weak, worrisome, or disobedient. Help our temples present to others as yours, full of your glory. I pray this on these who have come today to hear and learn and grow. In Jesus' name, for your glory, amen. Now, I want to give you six encouraging points about the baptism and the filling of the Holy Spirit. First of all, sometimes people hear the word, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and it scares them. And sometimes somebody says, well, have you been baptized with the Holy Spirit? And you're like, oh, I'm a, I don't know, I'm a Christian. The, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a teaching of Jesus. And if you have repented of your sins and called on Jesus as Lord, then you are baptized with the Holy Spirit. God the Father gifts you with his Spirit when you repent and confess Jesus as Lord. I think I missed one. A believer, three, filled with the Holy Spirit and power is Christ witness. Jesus just said it was. You can argue, and you can say, I don't like to witness, but he says in 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. So a believer filled with the Holy Spirit and power is Christ's witnesses and is the means of spreading the gospel. Jesus explained in a parable in Matthew 13, 33 about leaven and about how when leaven is placed in, see, I think the illustration he used was several pieces of dough and that leaven permeated through the dough. You and I have the gospel message in us and it is to affect and it is to cause our family members, to also rise up to a knowledge of Christ. It is to affect and impact. God is working in an insidious way, not with fanfire. He's using you and you and you and you and you and you where you are so that the kingdom of God spreads through our nation and world. Our fourth point about the baptism of the Holy Spirit is it is transformative. It makes you a new creature, is how some translations say it. Others, creation. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a circumcision of your heart, Romans 
8, I'm sorry, Romans 2, 29 says, the baptism of the Holy Spirit cannot be undone. Some people say, well, can I lose my salvation? No, you can't lose it because it's not something you have. It's something you are. It is something you are. You are sealed. Ephesians 1, 13 explains. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a one-time occurrence that God commands us to be continually filled to capacity with his Spirit. Acts 4, 8, Acts 4, 31, Acts 7, 55, 13, 9. We will be looking at these references and studying them about the filling of the Holy Spirit. Number six, the Holy Spirit manifests differently according to his will and purposes, but always in power and as a witness. And so in 2, 3, 3, 4, and 11, we see that the Holy Spirit manifested by giving them different languages, speaking of the mighty deeds of God. Their language was not chit-chat. The purpose of the Holy Spirit in you is to speak of God. Because the kingdom of God is in you, and you now, like Jesus, should be like Jesus, who spoke of the kingdom of God. Now, that is our privilege. It is our privilege, Acts 4, 8, and 13, to defend and to explain the Christian faith, to do tasks, serving, teaching in Christ's power. And I believe you have all these on your handout. The filling of the Holy Spirit, different from the baptism of the Holy Spirit, is commanded and to be continual, I'm summarizing, power for witnessing, necessary to please God, God's provision to serve in power, and God's provision for you in weakness, trials, persecution. They heard them speak in their own language. Isn't this amazing? At the Tower of Babel, God gave different languages and spread them. At Pentecost, God gave different languages so that they would all understand. And then when they went back to their regions, to their countries, he was fulfilling what he said. This gospel shall go to all nations. Now, there were different responses, and I'm not going to go over all of these because you have studied these and already discuss them, but I want to give you a word of encouragement. God loves you, and he loves the world, and he will seek you if you are here and not a believer, and he will take his message because he wants your soul to go to heaven. But there is also a warning. Just like some of those who saw and heard the presence of God in their midst, They mocked what was happening. You and I are going to be mocked in our society. We're already being mocked for our Christian faith. Know that you are not the first generation to be mocked, nor will you be the last, but you keep on standing and speaking for the Word of God. And that's what Peter did in Acts 2, 14 through 20. Verse 14 says, But Peter... And I have a list of scripture references that I don't have time to give you right now, but I looked it up how many times that scripture records what was going on at the time, and the next two words were, but Peter. Some of his but Peters were when he was doing great. Some of his but Peter was when he denied the Lord. But don't you let your but Peter failure be something that causes you not to continue to march forward for the cause of Christ. Because right here, we see the power of God working in him. And it says, but Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised up his voice, let's roll, and declared to them, you can delete the let's roll, let's not in your Bible. Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. You know the scripture in James that says, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. And Peter is saying these words to them. These men are not drunk. It's only 9 a.m. And any of those religious Jews who had gone to 
uh, the temple, gone to Jerusalem for Pentecost, would be devout Jews, and a devout Jew would not drink before that time. He explains, this is what was spoken of through Joel the prophet in Joel 2, 28, 31, and it shall be in the last days. Oh, friends, this is just so exciting. We're in the last days. You know that, right? And we are nearing the end of the last days, very, very likely, though we don't know when our Lord will return. But if you're getting older, your last day is getting closer. And if you're in a car accident, you just had your last day yesterday. And we know from our dear Pat Hannah with Mart, he did not know it was his last day when he went out to walk a dog. You never know when your last day is. If you're not sure about your soul being saved, talk to me. Talk to your leader. And if there's somebody you know and you're not sure about their soul being saved, it's time to roll. The last days has begun And Peter, you've read this sermon, so I'm not going to take the time to go over it. But in the very first part, that part of that prophecy was already fulfilled. In that moment of Pentecost, part of Joel's prophecy is yet to be fulfilled. And that is very common in biblical prophecy. It's like in Daniel. They would see as as if mountaintops but they wouldn't see perhaps in the valley. And so these prophets weren't even able to have a full comprehension, but by the Spirit of God, they spoke and they wrote the Word of God. And so Peter is now being used to explain part of Joel's prophecy has just now come true. I will pour forth my Spirit, and your sons and daughters will prophesy, which means declare God's Word. Even on my bond slaves, it's going to be to all people of verse 18. I will pour forth my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And he says, this is what's happening. God's getting her done. Joel, the first part is, is accomplished. And then 19 through 21 is the prophecy yet to be fulfilled. At the end of the last day period, signs and wonders on the earth, the sky will occur, blood, fire, smoke. The sun turned dark, blood moon. Have you read it in Revelation? It's there. Verse 20. The Lord will come to earth a second time on a great and glorious day. Before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. That glory that went in Solomon's temple, that glory, the Shekinah glory that led them, the glory of the Lord that is so bright in the new heavens and the new earth that there is not even any need of the sun, the glory of Jesus is coming a second time, and it's not as a baby. It's not as a suffering Messiah. We're going to be in the presence of the Lord God Almighty, who has already put his presence in us. Are we reverencing? Are we worshiping him? Peter gives us an example In verse 14, he stood up. It says, taking his stand with the 11. Are you taking your stand in your home, in your schools, in your book club, in your community? Are you taking your stand for Christ, even though others are mocking, even though others don't understand? Are you taking your stand? Are you a mealy mouse, a wimp? It's time. Are you speaking for Christ? That's what he did on the authority of Scripture. In verses 14, he said, taking his stand with the eleven, he raised his voice and he said, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. And then he said in verse 16, this is what was spoken of through Joel the prophet. Do you know your word of God? Do you know it so you can stand on it, so you can say it, so you can speak it? You're here. Praise God. Praise God. This is Peter's example to you and me. Stand for Christ. Speak for Christ on the authority of Scripture. Study the Bible so that his word is in your heart and in your mind. And you don't have to be afraid of what you're going to say. It's there. I brought a couple of things for you because I believe 
that this message and this passage with as much information as it has in it, and we could spend the whole 30 minutes on every verse. But what God has called me to do with you, if you are so kind to accept it, is to exhort you, to encourage you, to walk out of here as a recommitted temple of the Holy Spirit, fully understanding your purpose, to let the full glory of God shine in you. How do you do that? The way that I do it is every morning, I go in and before I get my coffee and before I do anything, I get on my knees and I bow before the Lord. And you may not be able to get on your knees, you may not be able to stretch out your hands, you may not be able to say, Lord, in that position, but you can sit in your chair or your couch or your bed, and you can begin your day saying, Lord, fill me, fill me to overflowing with your spirit. Use me. I had somebody come in this morning and said, why did you accept doing this? Why are you doing this? And I said, well, because God called me to. And she goes, I know, but why? You're already so busy with your ministry. Why are, you, why are you doing this? Because God called me. Because I have written throughout my prayer journal, friends, the two words. Two words are in my prayer journal throughout. Well, more than two words, but many of them, they're fill me, overflow in me. Anoint me afresh with your spirit, but there's one under my ministry column that says, use me. I just want to be used of God. I have these leaflets. If you don't know how to share Christ, you can get this. I have another one that's little bracelets. If you've got children, grandchildren, you can come up here. I've got a ton of them. So if we run out, I'll bring more tomorrow. But figure out a way that you can stand, you can speak as you are studying. Heavenly Father, oh, how we love you. Oh, Jesus Christ, Savior, we can't wait to see you. We can't wait to worship at your feet. God of glory, you have a kingdom. You have a kingdom. And you have allowed your glory to rest your dominion, your power to be in us. May we grow increasingly every week to learn how to serve you well. Use me. And if that is your prayer, would you close our prayer time by saying to the Heavenly Father and to Jesus and the Holy Spirit, would you just say to him, use me. Amen. I'll see you next week.